today at the museum. After 96 years, the roar of a legendary cycle car rings out across the track once more. But it's not the smoothest comeback of all time. Over at the Heritage Skills Academy workshop, oh a Mark V Mini undergoes a drastic transformation. Can I touch it? Of course you can, yeah. yeah. Don't touch the bonnet, though, that'll fall off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And in the aircraft park, a cargo titan of the past is unveiled to the public after a touch-and-go facelift. It's working well done, guys. And give me a hand getting it on the stand. Brooklyn's is synonymous with speed. It's born legends of the track, both human... John Carbin, number 30, who gave... ...and machine. ...lapping at 130 miles an hour. But behind the great drivers and their steeds has always been a team of incredible engineers, armed with the skills needed to build and keep these amazing examples of British brilliance in top condition. And at the museum today, Andy Kelly, tutor for the Heritage Skills Academy, is teaching a new influx of young trainee engineers to keep these old skills alive. Right, OK, so body fillers, guys, is talking about body fillers. We've got apprentices that are from all over the place, um, up and down the country, Birmingham, South Coast. Um, they're all working for employers, they're all employed students, and they're coming in every sort of six weeks. Next time you hit a speed bump, hit a crack in it, it'll just fall out, because it's got no strength. Basically, you're learning traditional skills, hand skills, from making a panel from a sheet of steel to fitting a panel that's bought in from a, a company. The apprentices are being trained to tackle the trickiest elements of classic car repairs and refurbishment. But this project is one of the biggest and riskiest jobs they've ever undertaken. Morning, Andy. Morning. Morning. You're right. The team have been working on Rob Pike's Mark V Mini, and he's brought in the bonnet and the boot this morning. Rob's owned the car for decades, and it has enormous sentimental value. But there's a few things he'd like to change. The Mini, it was my first ever car. I originally went to buy a proper Mini Cooper. Well, that's the original bonnet. But when I got home, I couldn't find anybody who would insure me at 18 at the time. So I ended up um, buying this one in a G, it was G Reg 1990, bought it brand new. The Mark V Rob bought came out 25 years after the Mark I. And soon after getting it, Rob, who now runs a freight forwarding company, began trying to transform his new ride into the Mark I Mini Cooper he always wanted. I had a bit of a fixation with Mini Coopers and the Works Rally cars, so within six months, I'd put, taken all the trim out, put bucket seats, harnesses, spotlights, number stickers on the doors, all that kind of thing. Spend about three hours washing it, polishing it, then go out for a drive, strap myself in the bucket seat and put the Italian job on. Got <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it would have taken more than just lights and bucket seats to convert his Mark V to the Mark I Cooper Rob dreamed of. Actually, he'd almost need to blow the bloody doors off. The Mark I first hit the streets in 1959, with the Mark I Cooper being a much sportier incarnation. Unlike the Mark V that was to follow, the Mark I had exterior door hinges, a distinctive moustache grille, smaller oval lights and sliding windows. Let's tell you what we've done so far to the car. Um, obviously, we put it on the spit. Now, 30 years after buying it, Rob's here today to find out just how much work is involved to convert his first love into a true Mark I. Apprentice James and tutor Andy give him the lowdown. The wings will definitely have to change. Yep. The gaps along here are different because the Mark I doors are a lot shorter. There's rust all the way along here. Yeah. There's a lot, I can say there's lots and lots of work to do. Andy's ready to give Rob a price estimate, and he might want a bucket seat to sit on. It's a big one, a very big one. The students, they've sort of uh, got a budget. Was it 18 grand, guys? It's a huge amount of money, and Rob faces a dilemma. Andy's explained that the more of his original, memory-filled car he keeps, the bigger his bill could be. You know you can get a new shell for nine grand? Yeah, but there's no fun in that. If it's a new shell, it's a different car. Even if there's all bits and it's repaired, it'll still be, still be the original Mini. Rob's decision is made. Keep as much of the old car as possible. He gives Andy the go-ahead to fix what he can and fabricate what he can't. 
And although it looks a bit of a mess, it would be just absolutely brilliant to, to, okay. to restore it. Give it another lease of life. <laughs> Round two. With Rob Sayso, the apprentice is set to work. It's a fine balance between preserving the original car Rob loves and stripping out the rust and the areas of the car that don't match the Mark I model. So what it is, we've got a car that's rusty everywhere. Because if we were to cut off all the rusty panels, there wouldn't be much left. So we're slowly but surely taking off some panels and replacing them. Amongst the worst affected areas are the boot floor and the footwell of the car. Once we've got the bulk of the floor out of the way, then we can start working on the other bits, yeah? Today, Oliver and Johnny will remove the rotten panels. Using an air saw and a steady hand, they carefully cut through the metal. This is quite a major, major work we're doing. I mean, the air saw is a lot quicker than I thought it would be. I think because it's so rusty and the metal so thin, it goes through a lot quicker. After a few precise incisions, this rusty old runaround is starting to look a lot tidier and smaller. Thankfully, we've all got the, enough skills to just crack on, smash it out and get it all right. I think if you were to look at the boot now and it's actually missing, um, it's a fair bit of scrap on the floor there. The car actually looks a lot cleaner than it, than it did before. It's been a busy and productive day in the workshop, with the apprentices all working on different bits of the car, perfecting and learning new skills. Rob gave Andy and the apprentices his blessing to make his Mini a Mark I by any means possible. And the team are now way past the point of no return. But as this stage of the restoration draws to a close, the question is, have they gone too far? In the mid-twenties, Brooklyn's was the racing hub of motorized sport for both motorcycles and cars. The incredible two and three quarter mile long circuit was seen as an iconic stretch of concrete for any motorhead to race their automobiles. To this day, cars and bikes that meet the standard are still invited back to the track. Uh, we're going to test today up to 150 millimeters a second. And former F1 technician Adrian Ward is hoping to join them with a vehicle he's built from scratch. So this is Oxford Brooks Auto Lab. Uh, this is where the students come to learn about cars, chassis, suspension, engines, gearboxes. Right, if you just sort of gather around here. By day at the university, Adrian's teaching the next generation of pit hounds how to make cutting edge cars go faster. So if you want to just grab hold of the front axle and give it a lift. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Excellent. But in his downtime, it's the performance of a much earlier motor that's on his mind. So I bring my car in every now and then um, to show students what a car almost 100 years old would be like. The Japic got its name because it had a John Alfred Prestwich engine, which in those days was shortened to Jap. This futuristic and ultralight motor was built with record-breaking times in mind and didn't disappoint. In the 1920s at Brooklands, it scooped a flying mile record when it clocked 70.33 miles per hour. Not bad for a 344cc engine. The original was destroyed in a fire, but Adrian's made it his mission to build a replica. So using CAD software, I managed to find a side view of the car, um, scaled up the wheel diameter. Then from there, I could work out what the wheelbase was, the height of the car, and all the other dimensions. He's devoted the best part of six years to getting every element of this handmade marvel ready to run again. Working on everything, from the methanol fueled engine and the bespoke cut-in half steering wheel, to the ash frame and hemisphere nose that allows air to flow through and cool the engine. Having originally run at Brooklands and breaking most of its records there, Adrian is hoping to take it back to the track for the ultimate test drive. But before that, it needs to be topped and tailed. Good job, it's light. <laughs> so we have to go to my friend's workshop to finish off the panels, so we need to make the, the bonnet and the tailpiece now. Yeah. Hey, you all right? Adrian's friend is fabrication and welding wonder, Marco. He's got a lot of work to do. <laughs> 
Marco's got fabrication skills that I haven't got, so he likes helping out, and uh, I come and help him every now and then. It's been a long time in the making. Made the top panels for the, um, the bonnet and uh, the rear section of the body. We need to trim them, uh, get them fitting nicely to the car, and then join them together. Uh, a bit of a challenge. It's almost there. <laughs> it's close. <laughs> With the panels all pieced together, they can now be moulded to fit the body of the car, using the age-old method of wheeling. This is possibly from that period, um, from the 1920s. It's pretty ancient. What I would say is, that, is do one at a time. Yeah. That is obviously the easiest one to do. Yeah. Because it's the nearest. Yeah, neither of us are particularly experienced at wheeling, so um, it's going to be present some challenges. Um, but yeah, it's going to be interesting. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> to shape his aluminium panels to the curves of the Japic, Marco uses a machine called an English wheel. He carefully rolls part of the panel between the two wheels, putting less pressure on the outer edges. The aluminium that comes into contact with the wheels becomes thinner and wider. So the metal in the centre of the panel is now longer than the metal at the edges and has nowhere to go but up. And this slight crowning gives rise to the curve which Marco will skillfully manipulate until it's just right for the Japix bodywork. So that's not really having a much effect on, on these ridges here. Yeah. There are no shortcuts with this process. They simply have to wheel. In the absence of years and years of experience, you just sort of have a go and intuitively, you know, wheel it where you think is best. See if it fits. Um, yeah. And wheel some more. It needs to be pulled in and it's not an easy one, this panel, is it? It's taken Adrian six years to get to this point and he'd hoped this restoration project was on the home straight. But Marco's a stickler for detail. I've got a few, um, few lumps and ridges, yeah. and it's flat there. The Japic's well known in historic car circles. When it takes to the track, its futuristic bodywork has to be perfect. So these wheels need to keep on turning. One here that needs to be cleaned up and um, drilled out, yeah? All right. The Heritage Skills Academy apprentices, based out of Brooklands, are trying to turn Rob's stripped back Mark V Mini into the Mark I motor of his adolescent dreams. And they've come to British Motor Heritage in Whitney to see a man about a bonnet. This factory makes new classic car parts using the original tools and machines. Most of the kit being used today came from 20th century car factories. Amazingly, it really is the closest you can get to getting a brand new Mini exactly as it would have been when it first rolled off the production line. This is manufacturing as it used to be, before the robots took over. An important lesson for the classic car apprentices. They make panels from scratch, so hopefully I'll be able to learn a few um, tricks of the trade which I can use where I work. It's quite good to see the different processes compared to a restoration kind of cycle, it's more a manufacturing place. The team meet engineer Martin, who'll be showing them how it all works. Yeah, OK, lads. So what we're going to do today is build a Mark One mini bonnet. If all goes well, in the next hour or so, Rob's car will have a new bonnet, but made in the old way. The apprentices can't fabricate all of the new parts they need themselves at Brooklands. But HSA tutor Andy knows that parts made here couldn't be more perfect for Rob's quirky makeover. This is an original jig, either from British Leyland or Longbridge. So this is 50, 60 years old. A jig uses pegs and clamps to hold a component, like a bonnet, precisely in place. Once fixed into the jig, the bonnet and all the bonnets that come after it can be drilled or welded, for example, in exactly the same way. So jigs help standardize the manufacturing process. First up, the apprentices are going to weld some bonnet bracing strips to the brackets. Martin shows them how. Right, this is a foot controlled spot welder. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So what you do is pop that on there. 
and now weld like that. A combination of heat, pressure and electrical current fuses the bracket onto the strip. And now apprentice Ben's giving it a go. Right, go. Take four. Slide it in. Go. So, yeah. Simple as that. He's nailed it. These bracing strips will attach to the bonnet skin, which was recently pressed at Taylor Press Form in Leamington Spa. Like British Motor Heritage, they rescued old tools and machines from car plants and have set them to work again. Back in Whitney, the apprentices are cross-welding the bracing strips. Line the ones up with the holes, stand them in there. That's it, simple as that, got to be in the right place. You've got these two brackets to go To see all the different skilled tradesmen in there, just shows the high standard you need to work to, and that's the standard they need to set themselves when they're restoring cars. A week ago at Brooklands, the apprentices practiced their stamping skills. OK, that's good. That's good. Stick your name on it, yeah, and we'll decide what one to use. They each had a go at making a commemorative plaque for Rob's car. It's looking good, though. All the, all the spacing out is correct, which is really good. There's some good stamping going on here, isn't it? What one would you like to show off your work and then put it on the Mini? Ben's was chosen to be welded onto the bonnet strips they're working on. So, OK, so Ben, you're going to put the plate on there. Go there. Yeah. That looks quite good there, doesn't it? That'll so, be fine, that. Yep. Yeah. There you go. It's a proud moment for Ben and the rest of the apprentices. Heritage Skills Academy, class of 2021, taking proper ownership of the job now, yeah? And that looked pretty good on the bonnet, yeah? All that's left to do is to combine the bonnet skin with the strips they've been working on. Right, this is the outer skin for the mini bonnet. Martin puts the skin into a new jig. As you can see, that doesn't fit along there, OK? Yeah. So what we do, pop that on there like that and knock it in like that. Ah, and there was me thinking it was all precision engineering. Put all the clamps on, pop that in there. One bonnet. Thank you. Best of luck with that. I think, I think that looks really cool. That's really good. Well done. Good job. If I ever see that car in the future, I'll be like, oh, I made that plate and quite good to remember the whole class by as well. The bonnet is a beauty. And Rob will love the fact that his new Mark I bonnet and his old 1990s one would have been made on the same kind of machines. But you can't drive a bonnet. This car still has a long way to go and very little to show for itself. Brooklands may have become famous for its pre-war four-wheeled wonders, but running alongside and then superseding the cars was a burgeoning business in aviation. Between 1911 and 1970, just over 16,000 aircraft, ranging from the Wellington bomber to the VC-10, were built by Vickers, who had a factory here. Today at the museum, some of the planes that rolled off the production from this very site are now part of the permanent exhibits including one that arrived back here in 1996 in spectacular style, the world's last ever Vickers Vanguard. When the Vanguard was retired, it was given to the museum by the then owners. And despite Brooklyn's short runway, a pair of brave pilots agreed to fly the plane into the site. To help them, two large trees were removed from the top of the runway so that the plane could land sooner, just after the large holes left behind by the roots. Well, that was the plan anyway. After a skillful landing, the scary reality of just where they'd touched down became clear. The Vanguard had landed short and missed the large hole and calamity by just inches. Over 20 years later, and thankfully in one piece, the Vanguard is one of the prize exhibits in the museum's aircraft park. Hello. Today, it's looked after by a team of staff, volunteers and enthusiasts, including Anna Burse and Justin Robson, who for the past year have painstakingly repainted its time-battered exterior. 
This is how bad it was when we first started. It's where we've got a lot of trees to the side and over time all the spores actually go and actually make their way deep into the paint. So it's not a case of just washing it off, you actually have to sand the different paint levels off, treat any corrosion and then we put it all back so we have a nice top coat of paint which will hopefully keep it alive for a number of years for visitors to come and see. But with most of the painting now done, there's one important step needed to return the plane back to its glory days. Morning, guys. Good morning, Anna. Hi, Peter. Dave. OK. Yes. Today, it's having its old livery reinstated by vinyl experts Dave and Pete. Uh, and I think what we'll do first of all is just uh, degrease it, dry it all out. This vanguard was last owned and donated to the museum by Hunting Cargo Airlines who made the most of its roomy interior after it was modified from a passenger plane into a cargo carrier. Hunting cargo, not cargo hunting. Yeah, right words, wrong order, might not work out. <laughs> the volunteers have put in countless hours of work, making sure the vanguard is pristine and faithful to her original appearance. So it's vital that the vinyl sits exactly where it should. The gap between airlines and cargo is 300 mil. Okay. Easier said than done on a 37 metre long airplane. At the moment, fingers crossed, as long as it doesn't start raining and the, the um, masking tape holds in place and we don't lose the lettering down the racetrack, <laughs> um, it's going all right. Uh, hang on. Yes. No, 480. Oh, okay. Why? Um, That's the way it is. I don't like that. <laughs> See that, it is a slight, it is a slight bigger gap. After lots of taping, measuring and fretting... Please be careful taking it off. <laughs> ..the team finally reached the point of no return. Right, well, I've just applied the vinyl down onto the plane on this top part and removed the backing sheet. So the next stage is to flip this upwards, then take this away, holding it to not let this wind catch it. Gently bring it down. Keep it taut and gently just tack it there so that I can now carefully apply pressure onto the vinyl area. I can remove the application tape again, keeping it very tight to the plane, not to put any pressure on the white painted surface. And it seems to be coming away quite smoothly. And with her passion for the plane, Anna can't resist getting involved with this crucial cosmetic finish. Uh, Dave, do you mind? Yeah. Would I be able to do a little bit? Yes, you can. You can. Have a go. Keep it, keep it flat to the plane, okay, yeah. like that, so it's not putting too much pressure on. And just, just pull. gently pull down. Well done. That was very <laughs> satisfying, yes, and it stayed on and the paint stayed on as well, so I was really pleased. Uh, thanks for letting me do that, appreciate it. Do another one if you want. Dave's worked on everything, from Formula One cars to a gold-leafed carriage for the Lord Mayor's show. So it's not a surprise that the lettering goes just as he and Pete had planned. But there's one final detail that he's not looking forward to. Right, it's uh, now for the difficult bit. We're going to hopefully apply this Union Jack all over all these rivets. So we'll see how we go. I've just got to place it into place at the moment the best I can, my hand, nearly, nearly lost it. I am a bit nervous now. The hundreds of rivets used to reinforce the cargo door have the potential to spell disaster for a smooth finish to the vinyl. So the plan is, as Peter's just about to start now, we're going to cut small sections at a time and download that and then work on to the next section rather than applying it all in one go. Got to be careful cutting, obviously, that we don't mark the the, the, the plane itself, all the lovely paintwork. A lot of rivets there. Leave that very loose yeah. there, because we can tuck that in, can't we? With the first piece stuck in place, it's time to see what the rivets have done to the vinyl finish. Because it's so nail biting, your concentration is just flat out on this one, and we've got we've got these curved recesses to try and get down as well. It's as Dave feared. The rivets are stopping the livery from sitting flat on the fuselage. It just wants to crease if you're not careful. It's amazing vinyl. It is. It's a slow process, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, what Pete's doing now, he's punctured around these rivets 
to try and release some of the air pockets that have trapped the vinyl. And when you look at how many rivets are actually here, you can imagine the effort that's going to go into this part to, to get this vinyl down and, and looking pretty good. And just to add to their woes... Those clouds are coming over, Pete, as well. It's all right, I'm getting past that. It's going to rain in about 15 minutes. Is that rain? Rain in 15 minutes. Oh, oh great. So we mustn't let this half with the application tape still on get wet, otherwise it, it will throw it away. So we're going to have to lift it off and leave a small section on and come back and put it back in place again. My bald head will soon tell you when the clouds are dropping rain. And unfortunately, it's not long before the rain starts falling on the plane and Dave's head in earnest. It's the worst case scenario for the team. So we've stopped um, and I've put the, the, the largest side of the uh, flag in the car for protection. The other two bits that are on the plane at the moment are stuck on. And if this rain stops, we may be able to re-dry the area that we've got to stick the rest of the flag on and we'll carry on. But at the moment, it's not looking good. Twelve weeks ago, Rob Pike tasked Andy and his apprentices with the most poignant and sentimental of transformations. We'll be able to spin it one day and it won't all fall on the floor. Could they make the modifications necessary to turn his Mark V Mini into the Mark I motor he always wanted, whilst retaining as much of the old car as possible? The team set to work and took it right to the wire, stripping the car down before building it back up. It's taken weeks of work and buckets of skill. So grab the panel, this right on. And it's still very much a work in progress. OK, that's good. Right, so I think uh, Rob's going to be here in a minute, so I think that's good enough, yeah? All right, so let's leave it there. But Andy and the apprentices are finally ready to show Rob and his wife Petra what they've achieved so far. Well, I haven't seen it for probably three months now, something like that, so I think obviously there's going to be such a big transformation. I couldn't sleep properly, so it's a really, really exciting project, yeah. It's like a dream come true. 33 years later, here we are, I'll actually get what I started out to, to try and fulfil. Tutor Andy is getting ready for the big reveal. But the thing I'm probably the most excited to show Rob, really, is uh, the work the apprentice has done with stamping uh, Heritage Skills Academy onto the bonnet. Yeah, it looks quite impressive, so hopefully he feels it's as impressive as we think it is. Morning, Andy. Yeah, how are we doing? How are you doing? Sure, I've covered it up for you. So how are we doing? All right, good to see you. All right, good Morning. See you. How are you doing? All right, nice. Rob. All right, so James, Max. OK, so we might as well reveal the car, yeah? So come on, let's see it. Oh. So it's not finished. It's screwed together, but we're gapping it all up. We can't get the gaps perfect until we start welding it up and putting a bit more integrity into it, yeah? Um, and we just clamped the back panel on just to show you it on there, but it's, uh, that's why I've come off, got to clean it up. The cant rails have I come... I haven't heard anything you've said, by the way, yet. I haven't, I haven't listened to any of that. Have you not? <laughs> OK, well... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Rob can't quite believe what he's seeing. It may still be a shell, but with its new moustache-shaped grille, smaller windows, exterior hinges and countless other mods, it's his old teenage motor and a new Mark I Mini in the making, all rolled into one. Can I touch it? Of course you can, yeah. yeah. Don't touch the bonnet though, that'll fall off. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> put the, we put the bonnet on it just so you can see it on there. Uh, we take the bonnet off. And that's the... Oh! The bit... We went down to British Motor Heritage and made this bonnet. Yeah, from yeah. scratch. So that's the uh, stamping they've done on the bonnet. Yeah. Yeah, Heritage Skills Academy, class of 2021. OK, oh. all right, so that's the bonnet, but we, get, we put it on, we've welded the hinges on, so they're in place. In time, this anti-corrosive black coating will make way for a willow green paint finish. But right now, it's those all-important Mark I details that Rob and Petra are loving. I love, I love these external door hinges. That, that's the thing, isn't it? This yeah. is hinges, a, very important. Gaps over the door, <laughs> small windows. Yeah. Yeah. Standing next to it now, when you're actually focusing on all these bits, that, that smaller window at the back looks... Oh, it just looks... Just the lines follow. It's just gorgeous, isn't yeah. it? It's so nice. Oh, yeah. 
The genius at the heart of this mini makeover is simple. Andy and the apprentices have managed to step this motor back in time while saving some of its all important heritage and memories. Still got all the floor and the back seats. So, Rob, what do you think? I think it looks absolutely incredible. A bit speechless, actually. It just looks absolutely amazing. It's like a new car, isn't it? It's just. Yeah. Well, technically, it is. Yeah, there's, there's, there's about 20% there's about of the old car left. Yeah. But Andy has one more trick up his sleeve. I'm pleased that you like what you've seen so far. But what we did do is we arranged a little surprise for you. Amazing. <laughs> so, so let's go and have a, have a nosy, yeah? Oh. And that surprise sounds like it's making its way to the finishing straight right now. Oh. Oh, gosh, beautiful. Beautiful. And this, and this is what it will look like. Oh! Right. oh. <laughs> Yay! Look! <laughs> Having heard about Rob's restoration project, fellow mini fanatic Steve Birkinshaw has dropped by to show him what he has to look forward to. Hello there. How are we doing? Hello, Hello. how are you? Hello. Who's Rob? Would you like to have a ride in this? Absolutely, please. That would be My brilliant. <laughs> are we ready to go, do you think? Yep. I think so. It'll be a few more months before Rob drives his Mark I. But after today, Andy and the apprentices know they're going to have a happy customer on their hands when the time comes. Looks nice. That's look nice, isn't it? So it's really good to see Rob connect the car because he can appreciate all the extra mileage we've done with trying to get things right. It's been a fantastic day out. Really good. Really good. Yeah. So it was, it was great. Fantastic. And uh, I'm very happy because it's so nice to to be able to see this lovely car to be put back to life and to be on roads and yeah. yeah. So you will definitely see us somewhere. Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> this is so kind yeah. of you, Steve. Really... That's great. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be driven. Well done. So I'm sorry. Just can't hold it anymore. It's full of emotions now. Aren't we lucky with the weather? Push. Right this side. It's a huge and nervous day for Adrian. He spent six years building a replica cycle car that first raced at Brooklands nearly 100 years ago. Okay. And with the shiny new bodywork completing the build, he's here on this historic but uneven track and understandably wary. The banking is looking very bumpy and rough, and the car's very, very low, so we'll, we won't be doing any record breaking speeds today. <laughs> So we'll see how it goes. I'm very pleased with how it looks, actually. So it's good. Just hope it goes. <laughs> and that's far from certain. Adrian and Marco have run the Japic at events around the country, but it's been idle since 2019. Now, it's been sat around for two years, nearly. And that's probably the worst thing you can do to a, a, an old car, and particularly a racing engine. So there is a degree of uncertainty as to whether it's going to run today. But Adrian's hoping that his replica is ready. A short checklist is all that stands between him and an historic moment at Brooklands. So we have to fill it with fuel, um, put oil in for the engine and oil in for the gearbox. And then hopefully it's ready to go. Marco and a museum volunteer help him cross those jobs off his to-do list. Nearly 90 years after it went up in flames, the Japic is rising from the ashes on the finishing straight at Brooklands. At the helm, a former F1 technician who's ready to find out what this amazing little machine and its 1920s engine are capable of. There's no one to race against today, but getting the Japic to this moment is a victory. This ultra lightweight racer is back on the track it dominated. But as Adrian makes his second turn of the day, disaster strikes. In the airplane park, the rain has cleared and the Vanguard's vinyl livery is finally complete and resplendent. Much to the delight of part-time staff member Anna Burse and volunteer Colin Mitchinson on the Vanguard team. Hi, 
Hi, Colin. Oh, yeah. That's looking good. It is. Now the scaffolding's on, you can actually see it so much clearer, can't you? Yeah, it's much, much better. I think the next thing we'll have to try and do is um, see if we can get this cargo door open. Okay. It's been a couple of years now since that's opened, so... Uh, have you checked all the levels? No, we'll go and do that in a minute. I think okay. we'll go and check the hydraulic level in the reservoir just to see if we've got enough, and uh, maybe we'll uh, give it a try. The Vanguard was largely mechanical, nicknamed the clockwork plane, mainly controlled with rods and pulleys, with few computers or circuits compared to today. And the flaps, undercarriage, brakes, nose wheel steering and its impressive cargo door are all controlled by a highly complex system of hydraulics. This little bay here contains the reservoir for the hydraulic fluid. We need to check the levels to make sure we've got enough in there so that when we do activate the pump on the cargo door that we have enough fluid in the reservoir. And inside the hatch, the network of pipes that feed the various hydraulic devices on the plane resembles an accident in a spaghetti factory. OK, this is the reservoir filler. This cup here is very much like a teacup. So what we'll do, we'll add a little bit of the fluid into here and then we will pump it in here using the lever here to transfer it into the tank. With the hydraulic fluid topped up, Colin is hoping that nothing has gone awry with the complicated twists and turns of piping that take it up to the hydraulic door. It hasn't been opened for two years, so nothing is certain. Here we have the hydraulic accumulator charger, which I will activate now to get some pressure up on the pump, which we can see from the gauge here down here below before we uh, open the cargo door. Now oh, that's looking good, Rog. I think that's enough now, so we should be ready to open the door. Oh my God. It's working, well done, guys. Yeah, wow. So far looking good. And right up to the top. Brilliant, you can see the hunting logo now. The door opens perfectly next to the gleaming new bodywork of this incredible plane, just as it would have done 20 years ago. I've been here since the aeroplane arrived back in 1996, and it's still an impressive thing to see this door open. I mean, uh, people remark on it, uh, and, and they're just glad to see that, you know, we are being able to work and keep this, this part of this exhibit in, a, in, in an active role, as it were. I think it's going to be a fantastic exhibit for the museum here. The team have done an amazing job to make sure the only surviving vanguard can carry on wowing the crowds for decades to come. Like most Brooklyn's racing drivers before him, Adrian has experienced plenty of highs and lows on the track. Three weeks have passed since he took his hand-built Japic replica for a spin and promptly crashed it. I'm afraid I broke up a car. Damaging the axle, track rod and wheel spokes. But Adrian and the Japic are back, more determined than ever to show the world what this 1920 cycle car can do. Right, so we're back again. Uh, we've done the repairs needed. Uh, hopefully it should be running better and we should put on a bit of a more show today than we did last time. The original version of this motor would have been familiar to many racegoers in the 1920s. It smashed countless records in its weight category and its designer, J.M. Walter, was well known as both a motorcyclist here and the Japix driver. And today, much to Adrian's delight, Walter's sons, Chris and Tim, have made the journey to see Adrian's hopeful comeback in a replica of their father's famous vehicle, accompanied by Anna Jackson, Brooklyn's fundraising and development officer. Well, it's really nice to see it. Great. Yeah, yeah. 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 There's a lot of very modern ideas in this, so it was well ahead of its time. I yeah, I mean, yeah. streamlining for a start. Yes, yeah, just for a start. Just and amazing. sitting very low in the thing yeah, yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah. But I'm just saying, I think my father would have been very, you know, very thrilled to have seen this. I think he, that are, means a lot to me, yeah, because, you know, yeah, yeah. That, I think that you appreciate been. what we've done. No, no, he's, he's, he would have done, certainly. Yeah, yeah. He appreciate it, yeah. He mm. probably thought, crazy man, why is he making yes, something yeah, like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Far from it. He'd be thrilled that his legacy lives on. But I also think he'd be keen to see a successful test drive. Um, we've got fuel pressure, so we should be ready to go. After six years of painstaking research, design and hard slog, Adrian's incredible homage to a past record-breaking model finally sets off on a proper run along the track that made it famous. 
It's been a long and bumpy road for Adrian and all those who've helped him to get the Japic roaring around Brooklands. But it looks like it's been worth it, and I think Chris and Tim agree. He's a, a faithful job to the uh, you know, father's original design, I think. He had, very little to, very well. he had very little to go on, and, that, that's, you know, and, and I think he's, he's scaled off photographs and so on and done a very good job there. I thought my father would have been impressed. <laughs> Recreating a long-lost cycle car and driving it on its home track has been a challenging but wonderful experience for Adrian. Maybe stop shaking. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice that you've, you've built something that, that's in their family and they're happy with it. To sum up today, there's probably two words, proud and excited. It's fantastic to have the opportunity to run the car here and quite exciting to actually drive the car as well. I can relax, have a cup of coffee and have something to eat. <laughs>